Last year, I, an 18-year-old female, was living in a very rural town in the middle of the mountains. Most small western towns only have one road that goes into the big city. Our road in particular was about 50 miles of empty highway, surrounded only by cliffs, fields, and occasionally a farm. At the very entrance to this road, once you enter the city, is a huge truck stop slash gas station that always seems to be packed. My mom and I were going back home after a midnight showing of whatever movie we had decided to see, and as per usual, we stopped to fill up on gas and get a drink for the long drive home. As we were leaving, I vaguely noticed a dingy older Jeep pull out at the same time we did, but of course, I didn't take much notice. It wasn't weird that someone would be leaving the same time as us after all. As we started down the pitch black road, the Jeep kept a steady pace behind us. Again, not weird in and of itself, until it came flying up past us before disappearing beyond a hill. Mom and I just scoffed. We were already going 65, but when people knew the roads, they often drove them at close to 100, even at night. After some time, we happened upon the Jeep from earlier. It was pulled over, but the back half of the vehicle was in the road, and what was clearly a man's arm was waving out the window, gesturing for us to pull over but we're not stopping. As we pass this guy, we have that feeling of, it sucks to be him, hopefully someone else comes upon him soon, or maybe he'll call AAA and get things sorted out. But once again, we weren't gonna be the ones to help. To our surprise, and no more than a minute later, the man flies past us once more in his Jeep, pulling over again several hundred yards ahead of us. It's about at this moment that both my mom and I begin to get very nervous. We pass him again, but this time, he flies right up behind us, tailgating us. He's driving so close that we can't see his headlights in the rearview mirror, and he's honking his horn incessantly, waving his arm for us to pull over. He carries on with this behavior for more than 30 minutes. Mom and I are both rattled and terrified. She's absolutely white-knuckling the wheel, I'm holding a pocket knife to make myself feel better. I swore at my own mom for the first time that night, begging her, don't you fucking dare pull over. If you've ever seen the movie Rest Stop, that's all that was going through my mind. The road is a dead zone for service, so we couldn't call the police, or anyone really. The picture of us dead or worse on the side of the empty road was the only thing that I could think about. But sort of the same way this whole incident started in an instant, that's the same way it ended. The man slammed on his brakes, turned around, and disappeared into the black night, heading in the opposite direction from which he was following us to begin with. The ride home was eerily silent from that point on. I even ended up sleeping in my mom's room, out of fear. The next morning, we had a discussion and came to the conclusion that he had seen two lone women traveling at night and thought that we'd be easy pickings. For what? I don't know, but I think he would have been right. Some people suggest that he had seen us drop money or a receipt at the gas station and was trying to be a good Samaritan. I think that's absolutely ridiculous. Nobody following two women home in such an aggressive manner has any sort of good intentions. We moved out of our small town a few months later for unrelated reasons, but just before we did, the same car was reported following a group of four men on their way to work. So maybe he just likes to scare people. But either way, that night was easily one of the scariest of my entire life, and I hope to never relive it again. This is something I've never really told anyone about, but I've been thinking about it a lot lately. So here it is. A few years back, had to be 2015, maybe 2016, when I was about 18 years old. I used to work at this little cafe inside of a car parts factory. It pretty much occupied the smallest corner of the factory, but it served as a compact restaurant, a kitchen, and lunchroom for the workers to eat. Well, this one day, I get a call from my best friend slash coworker. She's all kinds of upset because of this creepy new temp worker 
that made her feel severely uncomfortable by asking her all sorts of personal questions. What she drove, where she lived, if she was single, had any kids, and when she got off work, just to name a few. She didn't want to walk out to her car alone. Mind you, she was a woman my age, 18 or 19, and this dude was in his mid to late 30s, if not already hitting 40. We lived in Flint, Michigan, so we were already well aware of the evils that lurk in this world. I drive up to the parking lot, find her car, and park next to it while she has a security guard escort her out. We didn't see the guy at that point, but she did describe him to me and the security guard. And that was that for a few days. Someone found him, told him to stay away from her, and he did. But then he met me. I knew exactly who he was as soon as he stepped up to the register to place his lunch order, just from the description I had been given, and plus the creepy vibes that he gave off. He pulled the same intense Q&A on me that he had done to my friend, but instead of telling him to fuck off, or calling security or anything like that, I just told him a bunch of straight up lies. I told him that I drove a blue 2012 Honda Civic, which I knew for a fact was one of the second shift manager's vehicles, who always parked near to the front of the building. I knew that it was going to be there much later than my shift ended. I also told him that my shift ended around 9.30, which was really the time that I usually slipped out for a cigarette break. So when 9.30 hit later that night, I walked outside to smoke my cigarettes, and I saw exactly what I was expecting to see. That creep, in the parking lot, close to the area that the Honda Civic was sitting. He was just pacing back and forth behind two vehicles that were parked a few spaces down in the same row, playing on his phone the entire time. At one point, he glanced up and saw me staring at him, but I had my big leather winter coat and hat on, so I don't know if he recognized me at first from a distance or not. I finished my smoke and went back inside, explained the entire situation to the security guards, one of which was the original guard that had escorted my friend out to her car a couple days before, and they both died of laughter at the fact that I had pulled one over on the prick and had actually caught him in the act of being shady. I'm not sure what exactly they did about it because I went back to work after that, but I do know that they immediately went out and confronted him in the parking lot, and that that temp worker was fired that same week. Never saw that guy again, and I'm glad to not have. In fact, after termination, the company let all staff members know this man's full name. At that point, my friend paid to run a background check on him. It came back with a violent criminal history, filled with domestic abuse, assault and battery with a weapon, jail time for violating a PPO, and parole for some other things. To this day, I still don't know what his intentions were, but it doesn't take a genius to figure out that it couldn't have been anything good. So ultimately, the moral of the story is to always have your friends' backs and trust your instincts, because if you don't, you could end up cornered in a parking lot and attacked or abducted by some creepy guy that asked one too many questions. I was 15 years old living in a medium-sized city in North Florida, about 60,000 people but some areas were really spread out and rural. Don't think of it like New York City or anything, more like a lot of houses spread out over a huge area, plus condensed shopping centers. I was a bit of a punk that my parents had a hard time controlling, so that meant I basically snuck out constantly and was always riding my bike around the city at all hours of the night with my friends. This included fighting and constantly causing trouble for others. For reference, I was probably 5'10 and 150 pounds soaking wet. My next door neighbors were my best friends. Let's call them Nick and Tim. Nick was younger than us, probably about 5'5 and 140 pounds. Tim was 5'8 and easily 2'10. Nick and Tim were brothers only a year or so apart. On that night, Tim had texted me around 1 a.m., asking me to ride bikes with him and his brother to his girlfriend's house so that he could get lucky. I remember being hesitant because of how long the bike ride was. I had looked it up on Google and it said it was about 10 miles from my house to her street, but Tim begged for me to go until I agreed. Our city had a curfew, meaning any police in the area that saw you and assumed you were a minor would stop you and possibly issue a ticket 
and then bring you home. That meant we had to be careful about being seen by cars going by. Well, the bike ride to her house went by without any issue. We took our time, joked around, smoked a little weed, and genuinely enjoyed the ride together. We ran out of what little pot we had on the way, and then finally landed at his girlfriend's house with no problem. After what felt like an hour, Tim snuck around the back to go in, and Nick and I popped a squad on an electrical box and talked. Maybe about 30 minutes go by, and Tim triumphantly snuck out of the house, bragging about his time in there and says that we should head out. Annoyed at how long it took, and nearly sober now, we all agreed. The first mile of the ride went by smoothly, but things quickly changed from there. We had just passed a decent sized shopping center, closed at this hour, plus a church. We rode by the church slowly, in no rush at all. After we passed it, it led to a long stretch of road with woods and canals that run on each side. The road is something parkway. Two lanes on each side separated by palm trees and landscaping in the middle. Sidewalks on both sides, and on the right side, another road that connects to the parkway. We were all riding on the right-hand sidewalk, just for reference. Off in the distance, we see a very tall older man wearing a yellow raincoat and a large backpack. He was walking back and forth on the sidewalk under a streetlight on the corner of the parkway and the side street. We all went silent as we got closer. I don't think he could have seen or heard us as there were no lights over us and there were sprinklers going off within the median. I remember hearing him dragging his feet across the ground while also mumbling. He was dragging his feet almost like he was trying to brush away the concrete to find something beneath it. The mumbling was incoherent and frantic. Honestly, it made my heart sink and my stomach knot up hearing it. I couldn't understand anything he was saying, and the only way to get home was to go by this man. Nick said, yo, let's cross the street and take the other sidewalk. Tim and I both agreed. I remember this so distinctly. We crossed the landscaped median and a jet of sprinkler water hit me directly in the face. Got into my mouth and eyes. Tasted like sulfur, it was really disgusting. Once on the other side, we could hear the mumbling and scraping of his feet even clearer. I could now see more details about him. He was smoking a cigarette and was probably 6'5". Had on a huge green backpack, he was extremely skinny. Had long gray hair and was wearing combat boots plus blue ripped jeans. He also had a full white beard. He didn't seem to notice us until we were directly across the street from him. We all had our eyes locked in his direction when he suddenly stopped walking, talking, and scraping his feet. He looked up from the ground and let out this god-awful screech. None of us knew what he was trying to say. After the initial scream, I could make out, what the f are you doing? It startled us. We were now 25 yards away from him, and then he screams again. What the f are you looking at? I was a foolish teenager. I piped up to say something smart and Tim riding next to me grabbed onto me and said, don't say a f word to him. So I didn't. And in hindsight, I'm so glad that I didn't. He kept screaming in our direction as we kept riding along. The further we rode though, the fainter the screaming got. And then it stopped altogether. We crossed the street again to the other side and made it about a mile down the road, all of us still on edge. We glanced over our shoulders constantly to make sure he wasn't following us. We spoke briefly about it, how strange it was, things like that, but we were glad that it was over with, or so we thought. Nick and Tim were riding in front of me when I thought I heard something behind me. I turned around, and there he was. Maybe just a stride's length away, heading directly for me. The yellow raincoat hood was pulled up over his head and buttoned as he was on a bike of his own. This guy was practically standing up on his bike, pedaling as hard as he could. We locked eyes, and he began screaming right at me. I mean screaming. He screamed not words, not any language. A f***ing constant scream as loud as he could. I have the chills writing this even now as a 30-year-old grown-ass man with a wife and baby. If someone ever illustrated that image, and I happened to see it, I probably would have a panic attack. I screamed, 
He's right behind us. Stood up and began pedaling as hard as I could. I think we all did. And he was right behind us the entire time, screaming his lungs off. Every so often, he would get right on top of us, still screaming, and try to knock us off our bikes. I don't know exactly how long we rode with him behind us, but it felt like an eternity. I think age finally played a factor, because he must have gotten tired and let us get ahead of him a bit. Exhausted, we pull into a neighborhood and started cutting through yards trying to lose him. We jumped off our bikes and all just decided that if he was still chasing us, we were going to make our stand together and fight this guy. It was like a hive mind decision, all too tired to keep running. We saw it as our only option. We waited for him, but he never came. I don't even remember hearing him. I still can't recall where we lost him. I called my house phone, waking both my parents up in the process, told my dad about the entire situation. He told me to get home and figure it out. I asked to talk to my mom. She yelled at me on the phone and refused to pick us up too, as I stood in the middle of the street hoping this crackhead didn't come and kill us all. I got home with Nick and Tim in tow, who asked if they could crash in my room. Of course I said yes. I think we all still have some weird feelings about that night, although we've never really spoken of it again. I don't know what that guy wanted. He was clearly on drugs or messed up in the head. But it makes me wonder if he would have robbed us, beaten us, or worse, if he had ever caught up. Almost a year ago, I, a 24-year-old male, was fresh out of college and had just moved into an apartment with my middle school best friend, 23-year-old female, and her fiancé, a 25-year-old male. This happened to be after a long period of not seeing her in person. My bestie and I had a long and great relationship with a few rocky periods. I didn't know her fiancé well, but had met him a couple of times. He always came off as kind of rude and loud, but mostly nice enough. I let a lot of little annoying behavior slide because she was just so in love with him. I really just wanted to spend time with my best friend and keep a nice roof over my head. But over the course of a few months, I slowly discovered that she was trapped in an abusive relationship with the most classic example of a malignant, narcissist imaginable. Their fights, really just him raging at her while she cried, escalated to the point where he was completely trashing the apartment, breaking her phone and laptop, hiding her car keys, blocking the door so she couldn't leave, and grabbing her arm so hard that she had bruises up and down it, all the while hurling out the worst insults he could fathom at the top of his lungs for hours on end. This man is about a foot taller and a hundred pounds heavier than me, so there was nothing I could do other than give her a ride somewhere else, away from him until the next day, when he had usually calmed down. And he didn't like it when I did that. Once it reached the point of physical harm against her, I put my foot down and demanded that he move out, or I'd call the cops promptly. He wasn't technically signed onto the lease, so we did have leverage in kicking him out. He begged for time to find a new place. He was extremely drunk and high the night that he hurt her, and he promised to stay sober until he moved out. Not wanting to escalate things further, I agreed on the condition that nothing like that ever happen again. My friend and her fiancé broke up soon after that. Three weeks pass, and everything's going great. Ex-fiancé has found a new place, is in training for a new job, and while still loud and inconsiderate, he hasn't caused any problems. I'm getting ready for bed early one evening. I have an important meeting at work the next day. I put on my comfy pajamas, locking my door before I change, just out of habit. My best friend is out working, and it's just me upstairs in bed, an ex-fiancé downstairs yelling on the phone about something. I tune him out and ultimately try to go to sleep. My chest rattles from the booming footfalls up the stairs to my room, waking me from my sleep. My eyes snap open to see my bedroom doorknob rattling back and forth. Luckily, it's still locked. He lets out a yell of pure malice and bangs on my door. He screams my name and it's so slurred that it sounds like he's trying to impersonate some sort of lizard man. The hinges aren't looking so good. We lived in a crappy, cheap apartment with thin doors. I have to do something before he breaks open the door, right? I say the only thing that I can think of. 
What the f***? Suddenly, the banging and screaming stops. My doorknob falls still. After a terrifying moment of silence, he says flatly, Open the door, bud. Just come on. Open the door. I still laugh about that one. Like after all that, I just walk over and open up. Instead, I grabbed my essentials and jumped out the window. I was on the second floor, but we lived on a hill, so the fall wasn't quite that high. I still managed to fall wrong, though, hurting my ankle as I did. I hobbled as quickly as I could to my car and peeled out. I called my best friend and warned her not to go home. We made plans for her to stay with a friend after she got off work. I made it to the friend's house and passed out for a few hours of rest. I woke up to a call from my bestie. Apparently, ex-fiancé traveled all the way to her workplace with a knife and broke in. He assaulted her and held the knife up to her special needs client's throat, saying that he'd kill him in front of her. Thank God a co-worker overheard everything in another room and was able to call the police in time for everyone to come out alive. My best friend also said he was on the phone with her while he was banging on my door, and he said he was going to kill me while he made her listen. I was totally alone in the apartment with him, sleeping upstairs in bed. If I hadn't have locked my door that night, I wonder if I would even still be alive. If I had left my car keys downstairs, what would I have been able to do to get away? When I returned to my apartment the next morning, my door was absolutely obliterated, obviously kicked in. All my belongings were scattered everywhere, and the large butcher knives were missing from the kitchen. Instead sitting in the corner of the hallway to my room. If you ever have to wonder if one small act can really affect your life and livelihood, I'd encourage you to think back on that night of mine, where the simple act of flipping that lock on that cheap, flimsy door absolutely saved my life. Last summer, I took two of my kids and two of my daughter's friends to a renaissance fair. As we were leaving the park, the girls, 15, 15, and 16, were walking ahead of us, and I could see this odd man approach them and appear to ask to take their pictures. He had camera equipment, so my first thought was he was probably with the fair, taking pictures to be sold. When I got up close to them, I realized he didn't have an employee shirt on or any other indication of who he was. I stopped him from taking the picture and politely asked why he was taking a picture of my girls. Just one is mine, but he didn't need to know that. He had the gall to bristle and say, well, first of all, because they said I could, as he turned his back to me. i tell you right now, that was the wrong thing to do, buddy. I stepped in front of him and said, absolutely not. You're not taking pictures of them. The girls were visibly confused and the dude tried to motion to them to step to the side. I raised my voice to make a scene and said, You are not taking photos of my girls. He asked which one was mine. I glared at him with my best teacher glare and said, All of them are. He shook his head and began to walk off, before turning to hand two of them business cards after saying to call him. I grabbed them out of his hand and told him to leave now. He stormed off. The cards had perforations on the edges and looked as though he had hastily made them at home, poorly at that. They advertised him as a quote, modeling agent, with a phone number listed. The kids wanted to know why I was so mean to him. They had also assumed he was with the fair. But after I explained that if he had been legit, he would have been looking for a parent rather than avoiding one, and I explained what kind of modeling he may have had in mind. I could see from their faces the instant that this clicked. They all recoiled as the creepiness began to set in. We made it away safe and unscathed that day. I reported that man and his business cards to the police promptly. But that drive home, I sat in the driver's seat, absolutely fuming, thinking about what the possible intentions of that creeper were, as well as pondering the sheer audacity of that guy. I grew up in the late 90s, early 2000s. I spent a lot of time outside and I loved all animals, including bugs, 
frogs, and lizards. My little brother played a lot of sports, so on weekends, I was always dragged to his games, and after school I often had to attend his practices with both he and my parents. It was soccer season, and I had to go with my mom to one of my brother's soccer practices after school that day. I was probably eight years old, maybe nine years old, and I'm a girl just for reference. It was a local park surrounded by some wilderness, including some hiking trails. I rather liked this park because off to the side of the soccer fields was a creek with frogs and other reptiles. I'd love to go over there and look at them, try to catch them, all that kid stuff. It was evening time and the sun was starting to set, but there was still plenty of light out. I told my mom I was going to go down to the creek to catch frogs. It was down the hill slightly from the fields and obscured by some bushes and shrubs, but there was a clear dirt trail that ran alongside the creek. So I scurried on down there and was carefully studying the waters, looking for frogs. When suddenly a man's voice startles me, what you looking for? I look up and see a middle-aged man, dressed in typical office or business wear, button-up shirt, slacks, dress shoes. He was standing on the trail, blocking my route back up to the soccer fields, just looking at me and smiling. I was a shy and cautious child, so I just looked at the man and didn't reply at first. My spidey senses were already tingling and I remember feeling nervous and uneasy. I sometimes saw hikers on the trail by the creek, but his outfit and appearance told me that he wasn't a hiker. He then asked me, are you looking for butterflies? I saw some down there, as he points further down the trail and away from the soccer fields. I just said no and started looking around at what my options were. I felt the need to get out of there, fast. But as I mentioned, he was standing on the trail which was my route back to the fields, to safety. There were thick bushes on the hillside between the trail and where the fields were. So I started making my way up the rocks to the side of the creek towards the trail, further down from where he stood. And to my alarm, he started moving down the trail towards me. Need some help? He said. I was now starting to panic. Although nothing had happened and he seemed friendly, it just felt wrong to me. I just got stranger danger vibes all over my body. I remember feeling a burst of adrenaline and fear. I shouted no and booked it up the rocks, across the trail and crashed my way through the bushes towards the soccer fields. I remember the feeling of branches scratching me and catching on my clothes, but I didn't care. I literally scrambled my way through them all till I came up to the fields and sprinted over to where my mom was watching my brother's practice. I probably looked like hell, so she of course asked what the heck happened and I told her the whole story. I couldn't help but feel as if she thought I was just making up stories though, because I don't remember any adult going down the creek to look for that weird man. I'll never know if this guy posed a real threat or not. He could have just been getting some fresh air on his way home from work. Who knows? I just know that it made my skin crawl at the time, and even more so thinking about it now. I'm mostly a lurker on here, but have considered sharing my story several times now. I was hesitant because absolutely no one knows about this. Not my family, nor my friends. I've held on to this for over 10 years now, and figured it was time to let it out. Plus, I think there are some valuable lessons that can be learned from my experience. So here we go. For reference, I'm a 30-year-old female, and this story takes place about 13 years ago when I was 17. I had just started university and was excited about having a fresh, new start, since I'd always been a nerdy outcast in high school. I'd never had a boyfriend before, and never even been on a date, so I was naive and optimistic about boys. My introverted and awkward personality hadn't magically changed since entering university, so it's safe to say that I didn't meet any interesting guys at school. Late one night, I was in my room working on an assignment on my laptop when I received a request on MSN Messenger. The email address was a boy's name with some numbers. The name was clearly ethnic and likely someone of the same origin as me. Intrigued, I accepted. For the sake of the story, we'll call this boy Ken. We got to chatting and I asked him how he had gotten my email address. He dodged that question. 
I let it go, not thinking too much of it. This was from a time when it was normal to accept anyone and everyone as a friend on Facebook and other social media platforms. As Ken and I continued to talk, I learned that he lived in my city and apparently wasn't much older than me. As I'd guessed, our roots were in fact from the same country. Let's call it Motherland. I asked him why he didn't have a picture of himself in his display, and this prompted him to suggest that we turn on our webcams because he wanted to see me too. I declined, but he insisted. Somehow, he had convinced me, and we both switched on our webcams. I was pleasantly surprised and somewhat relieved to see that Ken was a good-looking young guy, chatting to me from the comfort of his bedroom. Seemingly, pretty normal. Our MSN chats carried on for a couple of weeks. They developed into texts, and we even had a few phone calls, after I had agreed to give him my phone number. I began to develop a crush on Ken. He'd asked me to go out with him a couple of times, but I was always pretty busy with school and our schedules weren't quite lining up. Finally, we found one afternoon when we were both free and decided to schedule a lunch date. Ken had a car and had offered to pick me up from my university after I was done for the day. I was a little too dressed up for my c programming class, but just right for the lunch date we had planned at a local vegetarian restaurant. Stupidly, I didn't tell any of my friends where I was going or with whom because I was embarrassed about going on my very first date at almost the age of 18. In addition to the fact that it was with someone who had randomly added me on MSN, I waited outside my building when a black car with heavily tinted windows pulled up beside me. The passenger side window rolled down and sure enough, it was Ken sitting there in the driver's seat. I was happy to see that he was as cute in person as he was on webcam. However, what I wasn't expecting was the intense smell of weed floating out of the car. Not exactly relevant, but part of the first impression. Admittedly, I was a bit taken aback and was concerned that he might be driving high. He unlocked the doors and motioned for me to get in. So I did, without dispute. As I sat down in the passenger seat and he immediately put his hand on my thigh, I nervously shifted my leg away. So, I started, do you know where the restaurant is? I can guide you if you want. He smirked at me, but didn't say a word and just began driving. Okay, kinda weird. I thought maybe he was just nervous or awkward, both of which I could sympathize with, so I let it be. I was about to try my hand at a little small talk, which I know that I'm no good at, when I noticed him heading towards the highway ramp. I started to worry because the restaurant was not far from my campus, and there was absolutely no reason for us to be getting on the freeway. Um, you don't need to take the highway. The restaurant's really close by. I can guide you, like I said. I tried to keep my voice steady, but I could hear my own nervousness. Ken finally spoke for the first time since I had gotten into the car. I thought maybe we could just go to my place instead. We can play Need for Speed and I can make some lunch for you. I was 17 on my way to the house of a guy I had just met for the first time and I hadn't told anyone where I was going. My mind was racing. I knew that this would be an utterly stupid thing to do. Despite the clear red flags waving right in my face, I decided that I didn't want to ruin our first date by rejecting his offer to make me lunch and play NFS together, which I told him I liked playing. So, like an idiot, I reluctantly agreed to avoid being rude. We made it to his house. It was apparently his family's home and was situated in a sort of shady neighborhood. We stepped inside and, of course, no one was home except us. It was sparsely furnished and looked unkempt which struck me as pretty odd for being a family home. He informed me that his Xbox was in his bedroom. I hesitated in the doorway, but he sat at the foot of his bed in front of the TV and patted the empty space beside him for me to have a seat. There was literally nowhere else to sit in his room, so I cautiously sat down, keeping as much distance as I could between us. I started to relax as we played NFS, and he made us PB&Js to munch on. I was about to laugh at myself for being overly paranoid when Ken did something rather bizarre. He got up onto the bed, sat down directly behind me, his legs on either side of me, which was an extremely awkward position thinking back. As he tried to guide my hands on the controller, I started to ask him what he was doing and as if this wasn't uncomfortable enough, his hands moved from the controller and slid up under my shirt. That's when I really started to panic. I thought he was going to try to grope my chest, but instead he started squeezing and massaging my belly. 
I was more than a little chubby back then, freshman 15 and then some, so you can imagine what that might have been like. I dropped the controller in pure shock and quickly stood up, fixing my shirt. I was at a loss for words and he did nothing but smirk at me and tell me he liked it. I felt completely disgusted and violated, and I'd had enough. I lied and told him that I had a group project to work on and that I needed to go. He asked where I lived so he could drop me home. Thankfully, I had the sense to not tell him, and I asked him to drop me back at school instead, where I would supposedly be meeting with my classmates. He obliged without issue. After our very uncomfortable first date, I decided that I didn't want to talk to Ken anymore. I didn't block him on MSN or on my phone, our only two methods of communication, but I rarely responded to his messages and I ignored all of his calls. Once, he messaged me on MSN around 11 p.m., asking me to come over and telling me that he would send a cab to bring me over to his place. Thoroughly annoyed, I responded, What do you take me for? Why do you even think that I would want to do that? He replied by saying, No sex. I promise. Just plain bizarre. I was disgusted and didn't even respond. He continued trying to get in touch with me for months and then suddenly vanished. I figured he'd finally gotten the point. Now, I wish the story ended here, but it doesn't. I last heard from Ken in late February. He had stopped trying to contact me shortly after Valentine's Day. In April, two of my family members and I went on holiday to visit another relative, who we'll call Anne, who was living in the Caribbean at the time. Anne, whom I love dearly, was, and still is, a bit of an eccentric person. She considers herself very spiritual and is an active member of a large, well-known, spiritual organization. She is deeply connected with Motherland, more than the rest of us are, and goes back for frequent visits. While we stayed with her in the Caribbean, she told us about her most recent spiritual trip to Motherland, where she met a wealthy and well-connected local woman through the organization, who quickly became a very close friend. Let's call her Connie. During our visit, Anne introduced us to Connie virtually over Skype, because Connie lives in Motherland. We chatted with her a couple of times throughout our vacation and got to know her just a little bit. Little did we know back then that Connie, who Anne had spontaneously met halfway across the world, would soon wreak utter havoc on our lives. Now that's a story that I'm just not, and may never be, ready to tell because of how many lives were affected and the severity of the damage that was inflicted. What you need to know is that Connie was an outright criminal and con artist who had been targeting our family from long before Anne had actually met her. Their meeting was no coincidence. Not only did she manage to steal over $100,000 from our family, but she took any peace of mind or sense of security that we ever had. When we finally caught on and confronted her, she insisted that we were mistaken, but disappeared into thin air once we forced her out of our lives. Now you're probably wondering what on earth this has to do with my story about Ken. Well, get this. The situation with Connie lasted many months. The whole thing is kind of a blur to me now, but we first spoke to her online in April, and I remember the whole ordeal lasting well into the fall. While she normally resided in Motherland, Anne had invited her to visit and stay with us, where we, my whole family and I, presently live. That's when things really took a turn for the worse. Some of the things I clearly remember, and are important to this story, were that, one, the whole time she was staying with us, she was trying to convince me to transfer schools to a very obscure school and program in the US. I guess you can tell from this I don't live in the US. And she was actually getting very pushy about it. Two, she had asked me if I was a virgin and told me to, quote, save myself from my husband. That part was disturbing. During this time, I was so emotionally drained and stressed that I didn't really think of anything but the situation at hand. In fact, I had stopped socializing almost entirely and even started habitually skipping classes. I had lost contact with my high school friends and my university friends were too new to really care. So my strange behavior and new destructive habits went pretty much unnoticed. Fast forward to one day after Connie's final disappearance in the fall. I was at home with my dad when my cell phone rang. I looked at the caller ID, and it was a number that I didn't recognize, so it was showing the contact information as whatever name the phone was registered under. 
My heart dropped into my stomach. My phone displayed a name. The first name was a man's name, and the last name was the same last name as Connie's. I started a panic and ran into my bedroom to answer the call. I had no idea what to expect. When I picked up the phone, I was greeted by a familiar voice. It was Ken. I honestly thought I was going to puke when I came to a sudden realization that he had been a part of this whole sick plot. Of course, I don't have any hard evidence to prove that he was connected to Connie, but let me explain. The timing of his appearance and reappearance into my life. The last name, a fairly unique surname, originating from the part of Motherland where Connie is from, and I had never known Ken's last name until then. And the fact that he had contacted me out of the blue, and I had no idea why or how, were all just too bizarre to be mere coincidences. Of course, I freaked out at Ken when he called, and I told him that if he ever called me again, I would call the police. His response was just a weird, dry, half laugh, and then he said, Well, okay then, in the most creepy voice you can think of, before hanging up. I knew in my gut that this was their last attempt to get back in touch and somehow slither their way back into mine and my family's lives. Thankfully, I never heard from Ken again after that day. A while after all of this ended, I was having a conversation with a family member, who was also closely involved in all of this, about the whole ordeal, and she told me she'd sent something extremely wrong when Connie was pushing to have me sent off to the US, to that weird, obscure school. She had an unshakable feeling that Connie was involved in some sort of trafficking scene, and that if I left, she would never see me again. The horrifying pieces came together for me at that point. I was just too damn naive to have seen it before. The memories flooded back to me when I heard that. How Ken had told me, no sex, I promise, when he invited me over and how Connie was telling me to remain a virgin. As I said, I had never told a soul about Ken nor about the weird V-card conversation with Connie. I strongly and firmly believed that Ken had been some sort of player in Connie's game and was just there to keep me away from guys and prevent me from having a boyfriend. For those who may be wondering, we never called the police on Connie or Ken because nothing illegal happened at face value. It's very hard to explain. I'll also mention that I tried to find Ken online many times after this all ended. I don't know why, I felt like I wanted to expose him or call him out, and was never able to find even a sliver of information on him, not by the name Ken, nor by the name on the caller ID. It was as if he didn't even exist. Also, I'm awful at directions and didn't remember his address or where his house was exactly. I'm sorry if this story is convoluted or confusing at all. I'm trying to get my point across without giving out any names or too many details, which makes things a bit challenging. I hope that this can serve as a warning to young people to be very selective on who you trust. Do your thorough checks on people, especially those that you meet online, and to be very aware and wary of people's intentions. Also, from this incident onward, I can't stomach a lot of these spiritual organizations. I never really liked the idea of them to begin with, but now I've truly experienced how they can attract both vulnerable people and also unsavory characters who are looking for someone vulnerable to prey on. No judgment for those who are into that sort of thing, it's just definitely not for me. I'd like to hear what you all think about this. Do you think my suspicions are plausible? What do you make of it all? Stay safe everyone, and to Ken and Connie, if I see either one of you again, I'm going to kick you square in the face. One evening last year, I was about 15 minutes from finishing the night shift at work, when I hear this massive crash on one of the windows in the office, so I get up and go check it out. Someone had thrown quite a sizable rock through one of the windows on the front of the building. This is made especially weird because I'm working in the industrial district at 11.30 at night, with none of the other businesses open. I go back to my desk, put a quick call through to security to let them know and decide that it's time for me to head home. As I'm leaving the building, I begin freaking myself out about it more and more, and end up running to my car, getting in and taking off promptly. 
My thought process through all of this was that perhaps the person that threw that stone was still in the area, and I didn't want to be the target for another rock. Or worse. I'm almost home, and I've started to calm down a bit, but that's when I realized that I didn't have to unlock my car to get in. It had been unlocked the whole time. I do a quick check with my hand in the back seat for any possible murderers that might be hanging out, but there's nothing there. Fast forward 30 minutes later. I've arrived home and I've called a friend of mine who says he's out drinking. So I decide that I'm going to go out and join him. I decide to hop on my bike and ride over. That way I wouldn't have to worry about a DUI later in the evening. I'm doodling along the road on my bike. It's a nice night and I'm in no big rush. Just enjoying the moonlight when I hear someone riding up behind me. I straighten up and stick to one side of the road. And that's when this man passes me, really slowly. And when he's right beside me, he shoots me a smile that I can describe as purely f***ing insane. I kind of flinch and I'm taken aback as he rides on. And that's when I realize, he's riding my mom's bike. I stop dead in my tracks, flip a U-turn and head right back home. When I get there, sure enough, her bike is missing from our garage, and one of my car's doors is open, the back left one. I was driving, and I had no need to open that door. So now, not only am I wondering if I unknowingly gave somebody a ride to my house to steal my mom's bike, but what if I didn't decide to go out that night? What if I had just been hanging around getting ready for bed? Would they have just taken the bike and left? or something much, much worse. This had to take place when I was 13 or 14 years old. I was walking a trail with a friend along a lake to go out fishing. After we had completed a blind turn on the trail, my friend paused his stride and asked me if I could see what was up ahead. I didn't know what he was talking about as I didn't see a thing. But as we continued down the path, my friend was obviously getting more and more agitated, and then he told me that I needed to get out my knife. I was confused as all hell, and asked him why. He just kept saying, can't you see it? Can't you see it? We were almost underneath him when I finally saw him. There was a man in his thirties or forties, looking ragged, worn, and disheveled sitting in a large birch tree that hung over the trail. About 15 feet in the air was what I would guess. He peered down at us with wide, bulging eyes and a look of excitement on his face. I was hoping you two wouldn't see me. Before smirking this absolutely sinister grin. At that point, my friend and I ran faster and farther than I've ever run until we were back on the road. This took place in Marin County, California in either 1989 or 1990. I don't know what that man was doing up there, I don't know why he was trying to surprise a couple of kids, but it still very much gives me the chills to this day. I want to start this story off by saying that I'm a 20 year old guy and I'm a college student. I currently reside in the dormitories near my university. But it's worth noting that these dorms don't have any real affiliation with the school, besides their proximity. Sure, it's all students that live here, but there's very little oversight from the school itself. I've been here almost nine months now, but I had something happen two weeks ago that still sends shivers up and down my spine. The city in which I live and study is actually fairly close to my hometown. It's not rare for me to swing by my parents enjoy a home-cooked meal, or do some laundry. But for the most part, I tend to keep to myself, stay in my dorm, handle my business, you know, kind of just do my own thing. So a few weekends back, I decide not to go home to my parents' house, rather decide to hit up a bar with some dorm buddies for a few drinks. You know, typical weekend stuff. But since I had class the next day, I decided to bail out early and stumble back towards the dorm around 2 a.m totally hammered. Now here's the thing about our dorm. There's this rule that you're not supposed to let anyone in who you don't know. Plus the entrance door automatically locks itself as an added means of security. 
which also means that you need a damn key to get in. So there I am, drunk as a skunk, staggering, struggling to open the door with my keys. And then it happens, in the blink of an eye, in an instant. As I finally get the door open, I spot what I can only imagine as a dude sneaking up from behind me in my periphery. He zooms right past me, making a beeline up the stairs. My first instinct was to say something, but man, exhausted and wasted, I just decided to avoid any drama and convince myself that maybe the guy lived in the dorms, perhaps on a different floor or something. You see, we barely interact with folks from other floors, so if he wasn't my neighbor, there really was no chance that I would recognize him. Fast forward a few days, I run into one of my buddies in the communal kitchen, and the poor guy looks like he's seen a ghost. Pale as a sheet, totally drained. So I ask him what was up, and that's when he spills the beans. Turns out, he's been hearing these weird noises in his room for the past few nights, freaking him out and keeping him from getting any decent shut-eye. We chat a bit more about this, and I volunteer to crash in his room with him. I mean, that's my bud, and I wanted to find out what the hell was going on anyway. So there I am, in the dead of night, curled up on an air mattress in my buddy's room, curious and anxious to catch these mysterious sounds for myself. And I have to say, they didn't disappoint. We heard some seriously unsettling noises coming from the walls of that building. But it wasn't like a neighbor stomping overhead or somebody knocking on a dorm door down the hallway. It sounded like these noises were coming from inside the walls. Naturally, we take this concern to the head of the dorms, explaining what we had heard. The next night, she marches into the room to see if the sounds are for real. Lo and behold, she hears them too. And now she's on a mission, checking all the adjacent rooms around us to find the source of those noises. But to no avail. Zilch. Nada. Nothing. Frustrated as she can be, she finally calls the cops. The police spend a good half hour investigating the dorm floor and my buddy's room. After tearing it apart, they find a half-concealed doorway hidden in the closet. Before even opening it, they surmise that that doorway leads directly into the walls in some sort of crawlspace fashion. The cops decide that the best course of action is to clear all the students from inside the dorms and have them head outside. That way, whatever is concealed behind that door would no longer be a threat to any students around. It took about 20 minutes to get all the students outside before the cops would breach that door. But what they found behind it is something that would inhabit nightmares. Turns out, the guy that I had accidentally let in the building had actually been living within the walls for at least a week. The authorities discover food, a chair, meth, among other drugs. Beer. I mean, the guy had a whole setup. Not to mention, they found an 8-inch kitchen knife with him. Straight up horror movie stuff, like I said. The cops remove the man from the property, taking him down for trespassing as well as other charges. But it seems as if the damage was already done. Many students lost trust in the fact that these residences were safe and began leaving in mass. My buddy whose dorm this was moved the very next week, leaving me as one of the sole residents left on our floor. And it's been rough ever since. I have a hard time finding any rest in this place, knowing that some dude was lurking inside the walls. Every little sound, even if it's from another room, sends those same creeps down my spine. I don't think I can take it much longer. While my goal is to stay here through the end of the summer months, every bump in the night Every restless evening pushes me one step closer to packing my bags and being gone. I'm very fortunate in the fact that my family lives right down the road. That way, when the time comes and I do have to leave this place behind, I have a house that I get to go home to. One that is safe and free of people lurking within the walls. This happened a few years ago, but it still rattles me when I think about it. For context, I'm a female, 
and at the time I was around 25 years old. I worked in an office of around 150 people. One day I received an email from a coworker, but I didn't recognize the name. The email basically said something along the lines of, I'm sorry if I did something to offend you. Given the situation, if you'd prefer never to see me again, I understand and will avoid you in the kitchen. I was extremely perplexed as I had no idea who this guy was, but I must have done something to offend him, right? I responded back along the lines of, I'm so sorry if I offended you. Sometimes I zone out and it can be perceived as if I'm rude, so I apologize if that's the case. After this response, he started getting irritated, basically denying my apology and acting passive aggressive about it. I wish I had kept a screenshot of these emails, but the entire misunderstanding had me confused as hell. So I sent him a message suggesting that we resolve this in person, which, looking back now, huge mistake. He agrees to meet me in the kitchen in the office at noon. I head there and I immediately see a tall, 30-ish year old guy who I've seen around but I don't think we've ever met. I explain to him that I apologize but I truthfully have no idea who he is, have never even met him before, and seriously don't want any issues. What happens after this absolutely concerned me. His face flushed bright red and he looked visibly angry. He was stuttering and denying that I didn't know who he was, before saying, You've been staring at me for months. When you made eye contact with me, you gasped and ran away. Okay, what the f I strongly denied this and told him that it was a mistake, yet he kept insisting that I had been staring at him for months and he could always see me doing it. Eventually, I realized that he couldn't see reason and decided then to end the conversation. Upon some reflection, I also realized that it's possible he thought I was staring at him because when you walk in the hallway next to the kitchen, there is a room with glass windows at the end where a bunch of desks are. His desk would be right in the line of sight if I was walking down the hallway. I recall that he had a funny sticker on his desk that I would sometimes look at. But even this, this seems like a huge stretch. Shortly after this incident, a coworker calls me into her office before slightly closing the door and asks me why I was talking to that guy. I explained the situation the best that I could. A look of fear and concern washed over her face. She told me that last year, that man had appeared in the office wearing nothing but a bathrobe, raving like a madman at people. And to her surprise, he was never reprimanded or fired for those actions. Had I been dealing with someone in the midst of psychosis? Was he dangerous? No clue, but I reported this ASAP to my manager, who took it seriously enough to tell it to the male co-worker's manager. I don't think he works there anymore. Thankfully, I left the company two weeks later, but I was extra cautious to not go anywhere near this dude for my remaining time there. And if I'm being honest, I was even cautious a few weeks after leaving. You never know what people are going through, but you also never know what people are capable of so it's best to exercise caution wherever you can. What's the old saying? It's better to be safe than to be sorry. Today, I had an encounter that was rather interesting and slightly more creepy than interesting. I myself am not in the best of health, so I often have to find apps or workarounds for normal activities like shopping. So I use a grocery delivery service. The delivery people are generally very kind and ultra helpful. I've never felt unsafe interacting with any of them. But this morning, I received a delivery and the driver was a lovely gentleman with whom I've interacted with on multiple occasions. As we were going through the motions and exchanging small talk, I saw a man walking down the sidewalk towards my house. Rather nondescript young man, didn't really stand out or give me pause when I saw him from a ways away. I live on the corner of an L-shaped road, therefore from my porch, I could see him walking directly towards us. 
I heard him say something unintelligible as he neared my gate. I assumed he was talking on a phone or maybe to himself, so I ignored him and continued my exchange with the delivery man. Sidewalk man proceeded to walk up my driveway and from several feet away happened to ask, do you all have a pencil sharpener? I said, sorry, no, as I was confused by the question itself, although my response was a lie. The thing is, I have a pretty decent ability to read people's mannerisms. It's kind of difficult to explain. But the way he carried himself and the look on his face put me rather on guard. My brain was screaming, stranger danger. Delivery man and I just stood looking at him as he walked the rest of the way up to my porch and held up a broken pencil. If I had been alone, I would have called my dogs to the door and locked up, honestly. The situation just felt off. But the delivery man was there, and I remembered I had a freshly sharpened pencil not far from my door. So I popped inside, grabbed it, and presented it to Sidewalk Man, who was asking delivery man how we knew each other. Hmm, whatever. Surely this was a perfect solution to his problem, and we could all be on our way. But no. He looked at the new pencil that I had handed him, then looked at his own broken pencil and sighed deeply. He then said, Well, do you have a knife? Delivery man shuffled, nervously. I thought, how f***ing stupid do I look? This dude has got to be kidding. I do, in fact, have a very good knife that I will not be dumb enough to hand to a stranger for pencil sharpening purposes. No, I don't have one, I said. Delivery man to sidewalk man with an unnerved tone. Hey man, is there something that I can help you with? Sidewalk man shook his head no and looked annoyed simultaneously. After that, they both began to walk away, but sidewalk man stopped, turned back, and with a crooked smile on his face, pointed to some sodas from my grocery order and asked, Hey, can I have one of those? I shot him a look, gave a very stern no, and locked my door immediately. I saw out my window that he and delivery man had a brief verbal exchange before walking away. I noticed delivery man did not drive off until sidewalk man was completely gone down the road. It may have been an innocent situation, but I'm not a trusting person. It seemed like sidewalk man was testing to see what he could get out of the situation. He was not keen to leave. It was almost like he was trying to draw it out and see how much I would interact with him, especially after he realized delivery man was not with me. I'm not naive, and my kindness is not to be mistaken for weakness. I'm going to be extra vigilant for a while in case he decides to show back up. But I'm interested. What do you all think? This all took place years ago. I was just about 16 if I remember correctly, because I had just gotten my first actual job, not just babysitting or working at a family friend's business. I was bored, no friends in my city, and I wanted to fill time and loneliness, and what better way to do that than to talk to people. I had heard about these websites to meet pen pals around the world, and I was interested. I didn't think much of it. I figured it was harmless. I could find people around the country to chat with, learn about some other cultures, you know, that kind of stuff. I wouldn't give out personal information, no phone numbers, address, any of that. I didn't feel like I was stupid. I made a simple profile on one of these websites, stated what kind of friends I was interested in making, just the basic information really. After about a month, I received a message from a man. I don't remember it word for word, but it basically said, Hi, I found your profile and I'm super interested in being friends. He then stated that he lived in the same state as me, though I know it might sound rude to be snobby about someone in my state contacting me. I did politely state on my profile that I was trying to make some pen pals outside of the US. I responded cordially though, and I replied to a few of his messages for a while. I found out that he lived in the same city as me even. I see you like anime. I love anime. I also see you've been to Japan. I've been to Japan a few times too. Do you ever go to anime conventions? 
Maybe we could go together to the next convention that comes to town. I felt a little uncomfortable at this point. I put right on my page that I have no intention to meet up with anyone, just have an online pen pal. I politely told him that too, and he didn't like it. I just thought we could be friends, since we have similar interests and all. I again politely told him that I'm not interested in meeting anyone in person from the website. He pretended to be fine with it in the moment, and went right back to rambling about his interests. I logged off the website for a few days and just focused on my own personal life, going to work, school, taking care of my disabled father. But one day, I woke up to notifications on multiple of my instant messenger apps, all stating basically the same thing. Hey, it's from the pen pal website. He had messaged me on like four of my chat apps, which I certainly did not give out to him. How did he find them? I was annoyed. I messaged him on the pen pal website. Hey, so I don't know how you found my IDs for my chat apps, but that was over the line. Really wasn't appropriate. And not one app, but you messaged me on four? I'm sorry, he replied, but I really wanted to talk to you and you haven't been on the website for a few days. That doesn't make it okay though. I also have a personal life, job and family. I can't spend all my time on there. That's why I messaged you on those apps. I don't have them listed on my profile. How did you even get them? He completely avoided the subject. I'm sorry that I did that. I'm just trying to be your friend. I just want to be friends with you. That isn't the way to do it. I'm very uncomfortable that you somehow found that information that I didn't give to you. I don't really think we should talk anymore. I don't want to be friends with you. I'm sorry. Please don't contact me again. I immediately blocked him on all of those apps and on the pen pal website. For a few months after that, everything was fine. But suddenly, I got a message on one of the apps and the user wasn't in my friends list. The message was basically as follows. You stupid fat ugly bitch. No one will ever love you. You'll never find a man to love you. You're so f***ing fat and ugly. Why don't you just kill yourself? do the world a favor. I rolled my eyes and blocked that account. Throughout the course of a year, every few months, across my multiple social media platforms, I would be harassed. I had completely forgotten about the man until I received a message on the pen pal website. The account had no name or photos. It was just a random username with numbers and letters. The message I received was the same nonsense as before, calling me fat and ugly, saying that I'm a bitch telling me that I should die. Once I got the message on that website, I knew it had to be him. I'd had no other issues with anyone else. I replied saying that guy's name, telling him that I knew it was him and that his behavior is really sad and pathetic. I just wanted to be your friend, you f***ing bitch. You better watch your back. Then the account blocked me. For a few more months, nothing really happened. I got one or two more messages from fake accounts again, but I had grown used to it and just immediately blocked them. But then, I received a Facebook message from someone stating that they were a police officer. He was contacting me about a profile I apparently made on a website called Ashley Madison. It's used for people to have affairs, hookups, things like that. I had never heard of it before then and absolutely did not have an account there. I had a long talk with this officer, where he told me his department investigates human trafficking and thought I was an underage girl, possibly one in danger. It had my personal Facebook account listed on the profile, as well as many other ways to contact me. It was at that moment that the shock of this all set in. He advised me to contact the website and asked them to take down the profile, but said to me, you seem like a sweet girl, I don't know who you pissed off but don't read the profile. My curiosity got the better of me though, although I should have taken his advice. Using some of my normal selfies, an account was made, and the profile stated a lot of horrible things. Very derogatory. It made me sick to my stomach to read some of the things that it said I apparently wanted to have done to me. Thankfully, the website took action to quickly take down the profile. The next time I got one of those hate messages online, I snapped. I didn't hold back one bit, cursing him out for being so immature and disgusting 
because someone simply didn't want to be his friend. That account blocked me without answering. I didn't get a message from any accounts for a while. One night when I was finishing up a shift as a closer at work, I was waiting outside for a family member to come pick me up. I didn't have my own vehicle at the time and my family would give me rides to and from work. As I was listening to music, waving goodbye to my manager as they drove off, I got a notification on one of my apps. You ugly bitch. I sighed, rolling my eyes as I opened the message. As I was typing out a sarcastic reply, another message came in that made me stop typing and freeze up entirely. You're all alone now. I could kill you right now if I wanted to. No one would ever find you. I backed up against the building. I didn't have keys, only the manager did, and they had just pulled off. I looked around through the parking lot, not a single car in sight, only street lights shining dimly around me. My heart began to race as more messages flooded in. You're so f***ing ugly, you know that? No one would ever fall in love with you. Your family probably won't even miss you, you disgusting bitch. I should just kill you right now. I began to cry, the phone shaking in my hand. Just as another text came in, a car pulled up in front of me, and to my relief, it was my family member coming to pick me up. I took a big deep breath and quickly got into the car. Sorry I'm late. Your manager already left? He just left you out there alone? Just drive, I accidentally screamed at them, tears streaming down my face. They asked me what was wrong and if something happened at work, but I was both crying and shaking, couldn't verbalize anything that I was going through. I simply handed my phone over and had them look through the messages themselves. We went back to our family's house and they wanted to call the police, but I told them not to. I had no idea who this person was or where to find them or how to make a police report against them. But instead, they called another family member who worked in the IT field. After they heard the whole story, everything that I'd endured for almost two years, they told me I should have made new accounts from the beginning of the harassment. I listened to them, and right then and there, I made all new accounts on every single social media platform. I worked at that job for another month, but my family had told my manager what had happened, so I was never put on closing shifts again. I was only ever given morning shifts, where I clocked out of work when the sun was still shining. But I still didn't feel safe. They knew where I worked, and my manager understood when I quit. All the harassment eventually stopped, and to this day, I still haven't received any more of those hateful messages. Now I'm married, I still live in the same city, but I don't live in that neighborhood anymore. I feel comfortable most times. I don't feel afraid that this person will find me and stalk me again. But even now, anytime I get a random message from someone who isn't in my friends list, my heart races for a split second. Recently I moved out of my apartment. I simply had to because I no longer felt safe around my landlords. I lived in this really nice Dumbo apartment in Brooklyn for a few months with my roommate, who paid for most of the rent since her parents were super rich. Our landlords were actually this seemingly really sweet couple who lived a few floors above us with their kids. The first few weeks were somewhat normal, except for the fact that every time I saw their kids in the elevator, they would scream at me before they got off and proceeded to run away. I thought it was funny and cute at first, but then their eldest son came to visit and began doing the same exact thing and he looked about my age, for reference in my mid-twenties. I didn't really think much of it since maybe he was just playing along with his younger siblings. I had no other better guess. But shit got really weird when I bumped into all of them together, and we spoke for a bit. Out of nowhere, while we were having a pleasant conversation, the dad apologized to me saying that his son might act strange, because he's, you know, a retard. I was pretty shocked with him just saying that out of the blue. I paused for a second, and I can't really remember what I said, but I do remember wanting to get the hell out of that conversation at that point. A few days later, I once again bump into the dad while in the elevator. I was pretty standoffish, and he was just talking about how great my apartment is, and how much of a generous guy he is for giving us such a low rate on it. Then he asked if I could babysit his kids, 
as he, his wife, and his eldest son wanted to go out to dinner. I said no at first, but he counteroffered by saying that he'd pay me $150 an hour. And being the greedy idiot that I am, I agreed. I know now that this is where I f***ed up. When I get to his place, I was absolutely speechless. His apartment wrapped around the entire floor of the building. It was the nicest apartment I will ever see, that's for sure. About an hour in and everything is going normally. I was playing some fighting game with his kids when we suddenly heard the front door slam. I told them to stay there as I peeked to see what was going on and I see the dad falling all over the place, clearly drunk. He started walking towards me and at the last minute fell face first onto the couch. I must have popped a blood vessel trying to hold back my laughter. I asked if he was okay and walked over to assist him. He then turned around, looked at me and said, my wife will let us, please. When I tried to ask him what he was talking about, his wife walked up to me, thanked me and paid me in one swoop, telling me to come back another time. I just kind of went back to my apartment in shock, wondering what the f just happened. And no, I definitely wasn't going back. I told my roommate, and she told me that she also bumped into the dad, and he told her, quote, My wife is cool, just so you know, with no further explanation before walking off. At this point, we knew that we sure as hell were not renewing our lease. We didn't see our landlords until our final month there. We kind of joked to our friends about how our landlords were creepy cucks. The next time I see them was actually with my boyfriend, who was well aware of what they were trying to do. It was an intensely awkward elevator ride, as when they saw us in there, they just went quiet and smiled, nodding repeatedly at us. As we step out of the elevator, the dad shouts, Hey! and winks at me as the doors closed. After that, I asked my boyfriend to stay with us for the remainder of our lease, because at that point, my roommate and I were freaked the f*** out. Our final and creepiest encounter was a few days before moving out. My roommate walked out of the apartment, and both landlords were sitting in front of the elevators, looking as if they were waiting for us. She said that they started sobbing when they saw her, and begged for us to stay. They apparently apologized for making us uncomfortable, and said they thought we were the, quote, pretty young girls they were waiting for. She didn't say a word to them as she got on the elevator and called me to warn me that they were outside. And that's when they started to knock on our door. My boyfriend answered and said when the guy saw him, he asked if I was there. Of course, my boyfriend said no, but they tried walking in anyway. I walk out of my room saying, I'll call the police if they don't leave. And they beg me to not before running out of the apartment. A few days ago, we get a text from a random number saying we could live there for six months free if we just gave them a few nights. Of course, blocked and deleted. The whole thing was such an uncomfortable experience living there all those months, especially knowing that these weird people had keys to our apartment. I'm glad that we ended up leaving when we did. I don't know how much longer, if at all, I could have gone on calling that place home. I worked the graveyard shift as a security guard for a recycling yard. Can't say the company here for obvious reasons. I've been on the site for about three weeks now, and it's been a pretty chill position ever since I got the job. Basically every hour, I make rounds across the giant recycling yard, covered in various precious metals that are broken down and then sold. During my shift, I have to scan various checkpoints and ensure nobody besides me is in the yard or facility. One of my other tasks is to go through some grass or bushy areas and over a set of train tracks to take a photo of the warehouse far across the way. This is to ensure that it's safe and clear. I have to use a flashlight with 2,000 lumens so I can see my way through pretty much the entire yard. Well, about an hour ago, on my round, I went through the grass and over the train tracks. I took the photo of the warehouse that I'm supposed to before submitting it to the logs when all of a sudden I get this intense feeling that I'm being watched. I can't explain it. My hairs on my neck begin to stand up, and I freeze. My flashlight is still on and pointing at the warehouse. When I slowly turn around, 
and point my flashlight directly behind me. I kid you not, about 10 yards away, I see a skinny, old, wrinkled white man with a large gray beard sitting in a chair. He was looking directly at me. He had dirty jean overalls on and what I think was a western style cowboy hat. He was bare skin under the overalls too. Now I'm six foot three, 220 pounds of man, but I screamed at a pitch that was absolutely embarrassing. Accidentally, I dropped my flashlight out of shock. Mind you, there are tiny, thin metal shards literally everywhere on the ground. I can't see a damn thing now as the flashlight is facing away from my sight. But I can pick up sound. I hear a quick pace shuffling, clanging of metal from footsteps quickly running towards me. Once the metal crunching footsteps are within five feet, I hear them quickly veer to the left and whoosh past me. Within three to four seconds, the metal clanging is gone, followed by the faraway sound of rustling bushes and plants. I finally composed myself and grabbed the flashlight from the ground and pointed it towards the sound. That old man was gone, past the bushes to who knows where. I was shaking from all the adrenaline, plus the fear. I managed to catch my breath and called several emergency contacts. When they had arrived, the old man was long gone, leaving no sign of his presence. I believe that maybe he could have been there to just watch the active trains move by. I say this because the metal chair was facing the tracks. It's still sitting there even now. I took a photo of it, more as a memento if anything, an acknowledgement of the fear that even a simple household item can cause, given certain circumstances. I'm telling this story from the office, still terrified and now alone. I have to finish my shift tonight, in addition to doing another 11 hour graveyard tomorrow. I can't quit, as I need this money. I was just hoping to get this off my chest. Old man on the yard, the one who may or may not have an affinity for trains. I wish you all the best, but please, please don't come back on any of my shifts. When I was a kid, maybe six or seven years old, this was the mid nineties, just so you know, we took a family trip to a beach in Florida. We were staying in a beach house that was a short walking distance from the water itself. We went to the beach and I was supposed to stay in the side of my mom, but I wandered way down and before I knew it, I was lost. A lot of the houses looked the same and I wasn't sure which one was ours. Plus I had lost sight of my mom long ago. It began to rain, just my luck. I came to a path that I was pretty sure led back to our house, only it didn't lead to a house at all, but a parking lot instead. Inside the parking lot, there was a big, dirty van parked there. It was the only vehicle around. I was about to turn back when I noticed an overweight woman with brown hair and a hot pink tank top and those big, clunky, thick glasses that were popular in the 80s, waving and smiling at me from the passenger seat of the van. She said something like, Oh my, it's raining. Where's your mommy at? Let us take you to her. It's dangerous to be out here by yourself. You could get struck by lightning. She was very friendly, almost overly so. In the driver's seat was a very overweight man, shirtless, hairy gray chest, and some clunky looking gold chain. He was wearing yellow tinted Elvis shades and staring directly at me. He was also smoking a cigarette, which as a child, I equated with being bad. The woman stepped out of the van and knelt down to me. She asked how old I was. When I told her, she gleefully remarked, we have two boys your age at our house. You should come over and spend the night. We've got movies, Nintendo, and in the morning, we've got all types of cereal. I'd been taught all about stranger danger, but at this point in my life, no adult had ever given me any reason not to trust them. The lady continued talking about stuff like how the boys had go-karts, and how they liked to drink chocolate milk. She made it seem very enticing for a seven-year-old kid, and at this point, I all but trusted her. I mostly liked the idea of getting to play with some kids my age, but then I remembered that I needed to ask my mom first, and I told her this. 
She said that that was no problem and that they lived just up the road, so my mom shouldn't mind one bit. It began raining even harder, and that's when she opened the sliding door of the van, saying something like, Now let's get you out of this rain and go find your mommy. I knew logically that I shouldn't do this, but the lady seemed really nice, and I was desperately wanted to get out of that rain. As I began stepping towards that open door of the van, I noticed an awful stench that almost made me gag. That's what set off alarm bells in my head, that something wasn't right. There were cigarette butts all over the floor. I looked up at that fat man in the driver's seat, and not only was he staring at me with this menacing glare, but he had this real creepy, toothy smile, and all of his teeth were stained a dark yellow. I could pick up on this very f***ed up vibe coming from him. I knew that I should run, but the woman was ushering me to hurry up and get in. Her demeanor had changed, no longer friendly and inviting, but demanding and literally trying to push me into the van. She sounded angry when she said, get in already, in a tone that was the complete opposite of how she had sounded just moments before. I jumped to the side and started running as fast as I could. The woman managed to grab onto my arm or wrist, but somehow I was able to break free and run back towards the beach. I think she tried to chase me, but like I said at the beginning, she was incredibly overweight. I made it back to my mom on the beach, who by that point was freaking out when she had lost sight of me. I tried explaining what had happened, but I don't think that at seven years old, I was able to convey the gravity of what had happened, and I don't think that I truly understood it myself. All that said, I was ecstatic to be back in the possession of my mom, back in safety, and I could tell that she was relieved that I found her as well. No longer in the mood for waves or sand, we began the trudge back towards the house that we had rented. We reached the wood slatted pathway that separated the beach from the residential street that our rental sat upon with no problem. I felt this sense of relief sweep over me as we got closer and closer to the house itself. But that feeling whooshed away in an instant when just before we were set to cross the street, that same white van comes ambling down towards us. That same heavy couple in the front seats staring practically through me as they slowly went past. It felt like their eyes were shooting four petrifying beams right at me. I wanted to scream, I wanted to tell, but I was unable to form any words or sounds at all. I was simply frozen until they drove beyond us and became smaller and smaller as they inched down the road. That lady put on a horrifyingly good act to try and lure me into that van that day. I know I got away from something terrible, Although it still shakes me to this day to know that it took a horrid smell and the sight of all those cigarette butts to know that I shouldn't have been anywhere near those people. I hope that no other child fell for their promises, although part of me certainly has its doubts. My name is Mark and I currently live in Portland, Oregon. While I'm not originally from the Pacific Northwest, promise of a good job and closeness to the great outdoors brought me up here about six years ago. I'd say I'm a pretty low-key guy. I work my nine to five, enjoy a brew every now and then, and for the most part, kind of keep to myself. One Friday a few months back, I'm running late to get to work. Ever since being asked to go back to the office post-pandemic, I battle with AM traffic and time crunches fairly regularly. Nothing new there. I make my way to the highway exit, turn off onto surface streets, and I'm about half a mile from turning into the parking garage that's nearest to my office. Still racing the clock, I push through a yellow light, and I'm about to wing it into the garage when I have to hit my brakes. There's a bicyclist that's about to cross in front of the entrance of the garage, and while I see him in plenty of time, and come to a complete stop with plenty of room to spare, this guy is none too pleased. He takes this opportunity to hop off his bike and launch into a full-on tirade at me. Four-letter words are flowing, his hands are above his head, he's now the color of a beet in the face. All the while, I'm still just trying to go and punch the clock. When he stops his screams long enough to take a breath, I roll my window down a few inches and say, I'm sorry man, I hope you're good. Any way you can keep it moving? 
I wasn't trying to be flippant or dismissive, but I also wasn't really anywhere near hitting this guy on his bike. Seems like he may have just been looking for someone to scream at that morning, and I was the unlucky one. After my single sentence interjection, a look of simple disbelief spreads across this guy's face. He didn't budge. He stared me down as I maneuvered around him and into the garage, but that was the end of it. I made it into the office, just in time to avoid being seen by my manager, and the day went on as normal. Clock out when the day was done, head home for the weekend that I'm looking forward to. No real plans, just not working for a few days. I make it home and whip up a dinner, probably call it a night around 11 p.m. I wake up the next morning excited about the weekend, pondering maybe hitting a new brewery or even calling a few friends to catch a Trailblazers game. But that feeling drained from me pretty much the moment I stepped outside. I don't have much of a driveway. It's probably no longer than 12 feet from the street to my front door. So when I step off my porch, it's evident that something is wrong. My car is much lower to the ground than I can reason why at first, but then it sets in. My tires are flat. All four of them. That's what I think until I can investigate a little bit further, and I see that they aren't flat. They've been slashed. As I'm walking around the car, I happen to notice an index card tucked neatly under my driver's side windshield wiper. I unfold the card, and I read the words, you weren't very difficult to find, Mark. Be safe. At this point, all ideas of a fun weekend had evacuated from my mind, almost the way my stomach wanted to evacuate into my pants. I rushed back in the house, closed the door, and locked back up as I sat down to collect my thoughts on what had just happened. The best reasoning and rationale that I could come up with involved the bicyclist from the day before. I don't have any enemies, no messy exes, Nothing like that. I'm not typically a person that seeks conflict, so all that I could figure was that my perceived snide remark didn't sit well with old biker boy, and he had somehow figured out my name and where I lived to exact a little revenge for either cutting him off with my car or verbally shortly thereafter. Not sure how he learned who I was or where I called home, but it definitely had me looking over my shoulder for a few weeks after. I guess the silver lining to this whole thing I'm more aware than ever of bicyclists and pedestrians in my travels, and I try to be early to everything from now on. Part of me wants to thank Bike Guy for the lesson, but another larger part of me never wants to run into that guy again. I'll be the first to admit that this story isn't terrifying by most means but I definitely got a great deal of catharsis from telling it. I'd like to start by saying that I'm not a believer, not in God, nor in any other superior power. I've never been religious or spiritual in my life, probably not trending that direction either. Because even if God were to exist, I don't think that I would care too much, because after having multiple surgeries, literally from the day I was born, it's obvious that I wasn't his favorite. I'm a guy, I'm 27, and I've had multiple heart surgeries throughout my life. Started off as a heart murmur with an open heart valve repair when I was born. Went on to have an aortic valve replacement surgery when I was around 16. A stent placement in the coronary artery near my heart at age 23. I'm finally in the clear now, and don't have any showing problems, at least for the near future. Surgeries had all gone great, until the third one that is. The stent placement didn't go as planned, and the balloon inflated early, stopping my heart almost immediately since the coronary artery had been cut off. I was actually clinically dead for three minutes. In those three minutes, it felt like an eternity, and I felt as peaceful as ever. Like when you come back from a hard day at work with nothing to do for the rest of the day, and you know that you have the day off tomorrow. I remember loving that feeling, but not seeing anything. Not black, not white, no lights, just nothing. Like a transparent background that goes on and on and on. Just as I was getting used to the feeling of, quote, 
laziness. I heard the voice of my grandpa, who had passed away in 2018. He said, you shouldn't get used to it. You're not staying long. Immediately after that, I woke up in the hospital bed with my mom right next to me, calling for the doctor to come over. Once he arrived at my bedside, I got to see the visibly shocked look upon his face, and after taking a moment to compose himself, he explained the situation to me, and how I was dead, and they were just about to cover me with a bedsheet, when a pulse popped up out of nowhere. But I wasn't surprised at all, it was like I already knew what had happened. I never had the guts to tell anyone this, since I thought they would just call me crazy. And frankly, I would call me crazy too if I heard this from their point of view. Four years have passed since then, and I'm still wondering every day on how this happened. Was it an actual miracle? Was I hallucinating from the anesthesia? Or am I indeed just crazy? I think it's a natural thought to wonder what happens when things end. Maybe it's different for everybody. Some see lights, some see dark. Some are flooded with memories of their life, and some, perhaps like me, just see a transparent void. Although it was a calm and tranquil representation to me, I'm not racing to feel that again. In fact, I hope it's many decades before I feel that again. And it's still very surreal to me to know that even for just a moment or two, I was not on the same plane of existence as those of you that are listening to my story today. A little background to this story. I'm a 28-year-old female, and I'm a dog walker slash pet sitter by trade. Some of the dogs that I walk have reactivity issues, as did this one dog, a pit lab mix. She used to be a bad puller, along with being incredibly reactive to other dogs on leash the moment that she'd see them. Through lots of work and training with her, she's come a long way with her reactivity to the point it really isn't even an issue anymore even when other owners' carelessness allows their dogs to get too close for comfort. On this one walk, she was an absolute dream the whole time. Past multiple dogs without issue, she would just look at me for her treat that she knew she was going to get if she were good. We turned down a side street that looked completely vacant at that time, so I could give her some more relaxed walking time, and all went well for a while. Not a soul in sight, until there was. While I'm usually very good at keeping my head on a swivel, as some of my walks are not in the safest areas of my town, this guy took me by surprise. I don't know how he did it, but he got about two, maybe three feet behind us without me or my dog knowing that he was there. When all of a sudden he shouted something unintelligible, I could only make out the last two words. Your dog. Immediately my dog, with no prior history of human reactivity, got between us and started growling, snapping, and lunging aggressively at this man. I'm a petite and vertically challenged woman at only five foot two, and I'd guess that this man was close to six foot six at the very least, and incredibly muscular. When I first turned to face him, it looked as if he had a sly grin upon his face, and while it was dark enough out that I couldn't make out a lot of his features, I could certainly see the little bit of light we had glint off of his teeth. That smirk only lasted a moment though. As soon as he saw my dog trying to attack him, as well as me struggling to hold her back, he threw his arms up and bolted across the street without another word, disappearing quickly down an adjacent alley. I've never praised a dog for reactivity until that very moment. I gave her all the treats I had left in my pocket, took her home and told her owner what had just happened and how her dog may have just saved my life. Of course, I hope that I'm wrong Maybe the guy was just slow or terrible with social cues, but neither the dog nor I got that impression that night. Needless to say, she's by far my favorite client dog. I go on walks with her still every week, but we haven't gone down that street again while there are no people about. I'm beyond blessed to have her and to get to walk her weekly, but I do hope that I never meet the your dog guy again. I wanted to get on here and share this story while it's still fresh in my mind. 
maybe you all can help me make sense of what's going on. This all started a couple of days ago, July 5th, where I'd gotten a random call from quote, FedEx, around 10 p.m., where they would ask me for my name and address. I ship a lot of things through FedEx, and I have a lot of deliveries to me from FedEx, so I knew they already had my information. I stupidly gave up my info, thinking that it might be a package that was lost and somehow found its way back to my house. Hindsight, I should have known FedEx doesn't deliver past 8 p.m., and that red flags should have been waving, and warning bells should have been going off in my head. I didn't think anything of it until I got another phone call saying that they can't find my unit number and asked me to come out to the roundabout near my place. My father thought this was a weird request, so he patrolled the area looking for these supposed delivery people. My dad did around four laps. The first lap, there was nothing there. But then I got curious and joined him for the second lap. Yet again, nothing. I went back into my home as my dad did a third lap around the house. He found a nondescript gray SUV at the corner and confronted them. They told my dad that they weren't delivery people and my dad left to do another confirmation check. As he was doing his final lap, that same SUV was no longer there. The next day, July 6th, Somewhere between 7 p.m. and 10 p.m., we hear the doorbell ring as I go down to check it out. It was two individuals, probably around the ages of 20. They knew my name and were calling out for me, but I had no idea who either of these guys were. I thought it was absolutely weird because I'd never seen them before. I didn't feel safe, so I obviously didn't open the door to them. But they came back over and over again using the same tactic. Eventually, we called the police and talked about what we should do. The cops told me to call them back if this were to happen again. The next night, July 7th, it was very quiet, nothing weird happened, so we thought that the worst had ended, and whatever prank this was, or whatever it was, had just fizzled out. But the next day, July 8th, it was the same type of quietness, but as 11 p.m. approached, my security camera spotted an individual with a mask on, taking photos or videos of my house. This was the breaking point for us. We called the police and informed them about this weird behavior. They didn't send a car or officers out that night, but they did take a report. And while we weren't 100% satisfied with the result, we did try to put this out of our minds. I had a hard time falling asleep that night. So I was casually just lying in the living room around 3 a.m. when I heard something thunk outside of my balcony. I thought it could have been anything and didn't mind it until it thunked again. I went to the balcony to go see what I was hearing and that's when it clicked. When I pulled the curtain back to get an eye on what it was that I was hearing, I met by the silhouette of a man pressed up against the glass sliding door attempting to pry the handle of the door open. I was face to face with a potential intruder. This is when I began to scream for my life, yelling for my family for backup. The moment that I began to scream, whoever was on the other side of that glass door quickly abandoned their plan before hopping over the rail and escaping out of sight. I'm thankful, albeit a little bit freaked out, that I checked the balcony that morning. Who knows what would have happened if they gained entrance into the house. It's now July 9th, and I haven't gotten a wink of sleep in these last few days, thinking of the terror that I faced. Was I randomly selected for a home invasion? How did they get my name? What do you think they wanted from me? While I'm content to not know the answer to any of these questions, I still can't help but wonder. I didn't know where to post this. This story happened to me just a few days back, and it makes my blood run cold to think about it. My kid, two years old, has been running out the back door and having us chase her. It's a naughty habit, and it can be quite scary when she bolts out the door. So she did that again as I ran out right after her, calling her name, telling her to wait for mommy. She's just gone down the deck stairs, and I'm right there behind her when, bam. 
bam, gunshots, and a man running right in front of us in the alley behind my house with a small silver handgun pointed down the alley behind him. He's in a black pleather jacket and a green hoodie. Can't be much older than a teenager, but he has a determined, confident, unflappable air to him that sends chills down my spine. I'm having a hard time even describing it. He is so close that there isn't time to do anything more than grab my child and duck behind the chicken coop behind my house. I guess I figured he'd keep running down the alley and we could crouch there till he disappeared. Only he doesn't. He hangs a hard left and jumps my neighbor's fence, the neighbor whose yard borders my chicken enclosure. This guy walks within feet of us, begins to exit by the neighbor's gate. Then, and this moment will stay with me for eternity, he hears my toddler's scream crying, the only sound around at that moment. He stops dead in his tracks with his hand on his gun, turns to look for the source of the crying. I can't hide any more than I'm hiding and if he turns his head an inch more, I'm sure that he'll see us. Somehow, I squeeze and lean just enough out of sight that he just doesn't see us. There was something in his very calm energy that absolutely petrified me. A shooter who's just had a gun battle in the middle of the day in a little family neighborhood seems to give no fucks naturally if others are hurt. But I had this horrible cold dread all over me in that moment that if he turned and saw me, saw us, saw the expression on my face, that he would have to shoot me because my face said, I saw what you did. It was the most terrifying moment of my entire life. I felt perched between utter peril and life, the breathing, screaming life in my arms. Would he turn that little gun on us? Somehow, incredibly, miraculously, amazingly, as though the pull of investigating the crying so close to him was suddenly overwhelmed by his desire to get the fuck out of Dodge. He puts his gun in his pocket, exits through the gate, runs across the street, jumps the across the street neighbor's fence, and disappears. In my haste to get us to safety, I ended up smacking my kid's head on the wall as I tried to get us back inside. I'm sorry, baby. And freaking out, I pulled all the curtains shut, locked the doors, then spent 10 minutes getting put on hold by 911. When the cops did arrive, I gave them my eyewitness account and my neighbor, who had been about to take her trash out and saw it all as well, gave the same account. They caught the guy that he was shooting at, but they never caught the shooter that I saw. Like I said, it still sends chills down my spine. What if he were to come back? What if those bullets had struck my toddler, running towards the shooter? A little girl was recently killed in the exact same way at a park that we frequent, sprayed with bullets from a gun battle in the middle of the day, in the middle of a playground. It makes me sick to my stomach, and I'm not even sure that I want to live in this city or country anymore. The story that I'm about to tell unfolded about a year ago. It's something that still gives me a charming amount of PTSD. I'm currently on anxiety medication for it, even though I have all the facts now. So I grew up in a small town. Just for a little bit of context, I was one of three children. I hated my stepdad, and I hated living in my hometown. I was determined to get the hell out of there from a young age. So at 15, I started working at one of the two local pizza places. By 16, I was able to afford a car, albeit a beat up one, but it allowed me to get on the road and make deliveries, which meant more money for me. I had previously been robbed during a pizza delivery at a Super Bowl party one time. I was held at knife point and had to forfeit all of my pizza as well as the cash. This oddly enough didn't bug me that much. I don't know why. To this day, I barely find myself thinking about it, but after this experience, I took to carrying a can of pepper spray with me at all times. So I'll move on to the incident at hand. It was late one night, nearing closing time, which is 1am. We had gotten a call to deliver three pizzas to an address the next town over. The next town over is a place that's out of our delivery range, but 
sometimes we bend the rules based on the size of the order. So let me explain the circumstances. Out of all of our delivery drivers, as well as the assistant manager at the time, there were a few that were peddling drugs. A quote-unquote customer would have to ask for a very specific order, specific sizes, specific toppings, and in a certain order. No exceptions. So it was kind of an unwritten rule for one of those specific drivers to make that delivery. I had never expressed interest in being one of them, but on this night, I became one. I knew the tools of the trade, so when I saw the garlic bread bag on top of those specific pizza orders, I knew what my task was. My assistant manager at the time even specifically instructed me to get the envelope from the customer and that he was sure they were a really big tipper, implying that I would get a service fee for the trouble. I didn't want to conduct this, but my hands were sort of tied. Desperation does that to a person. All I wanted to do was finish my shift, so I took off with haste. It took me about 30 minutes to get to the location. It was in a sparsely populated neighborhood. I went up to the door of the address and was greeted by a girl. I actually went to school with her, so for some reason, that put me at ease a little bit. But she had changed. A lot. She was really pretty at one point and super outgoing, but now... She looks as if she had developed a problem, which isn't incredibly uncommon in my area. She greeted me with a smile and accepted the pizzas. When then, out of the darkness, my arms were restrained behind my back, and mere seconds later I found the barrel of a 45 revolver placed right up against my head. I instantly began to plead for my life, which only seemed to amuse them. The one with the gun demanded my wallet. I saw no point in arguing. I told him where he could find it. When I didn't have enough money in it, he demanded all the work cash. For a little more context, pizza places will typically tell you that the drivers don't carry more than $20 in change. But this is a lie. This is mostly said so that it doesn't seem like we're carrying more money in case of a robbery situation. But the bad guys knew this. The guy with the gun hit me in the face when I didn't produce the rest of the money. I usually leave it in the car. And he didn't accept my explanation. At that point... I was forced into the house. I screamed for help, but it accomplished absolutely nothing. The guy that was holding me threw me onto the couch, and the girl had closed the door. I explained to them that I wasn't aware of any policy, and if they had an issue, to please take it up with my assistant manager. I know now just how ridiculous that sounds. The guy with the gun, who was clearly under the influence, asked for one driver specifically. He asked why he didn't show up. I told him that he was making other deliveries. It took everything in me not to cry at this point. After asking me some other questions that I couldn't answer, he put the gun to my head and pulled the hammer back. He then instructed me to call the other driver and have him present himself. I slowly complied, but instead of grabbing my phone, I grabbed that pepper spray. It felt stupid, but I saw a brief glimpse of opportunity to get the hell out of there. I elbowed the pistol from my face and sprayed the whole canister into his. I emptied my entire clip, spraying him in the eyes, nose, and inside the mouth. The smell of that stuff still irritates my sinuses when I think about it, and I didn't even take a direct hit of the stuff. Now I've been in exactly three fights in my entire life before this, and I got my ass kicked in all three of them. But after spraying him, I hit him in the groin and then slammed my fist down into his face. We wrestled for the pistol for a few seconds. I managed to get it on the floor before kicking it away. The other guy ran for it, but I beat him to it. Once I had the gun in my hand, he backed off and asked me to leave. Now I'm not a violent person in the slightest, but I'll admit that when I think back, I still get some joy out of the look on his face when he saw me holding that gun. I was on cloud nine for a few moments, but once I got a healthy distance from the house, I pulled my car over and immediately threw up. I realized that I was still holding the pistol. Upon further observation, I noticed that it only had one bullet in it, and it wasn't the chambered one. He could have pulled that trigger about four times before I got killed. When I got back to the restaurant, my manager and I got into a heated argument over not bringing his product back. I simply left. I wasn't having that after my night. 
When I got home, I told my stepdad about what had happened. He would actually later go find my manager about it. I don't know exactly what happened, but when I got to work on Monday, I clocked in with absolutely zero issue. I worked there for about another month before deciding I'd rather go struggle somewhere else. I knew that it was time. I've since moved about three hours away, have my own two-bedroom apartment, and I'm a culinary student. Through my program, I got a job working at, and you guessed it, a pizza place. But it's a gourmet pizza place, and it's something that allows me to take pride in my cooking. I've since bought a gun as well. I'm still extremely cautious about things, but I'd say life is looking up. This happened over the Memorial Day weekend. And before anybody can ask, I want you to know that we've already reported this to everyone that we can think of it being relevant to. I spent the weekend with two girlfriends in Las Vegas. We decided to call a lift to take us from our hotel on the Strip to old Las Vegas to see some of the hotels and the sights on Fremont Street. The lift driver that we called was an older man from Greece. He seemed friendly enough in the beginning of the ride, so no red flags yet. At one point, the driver began asking one of my friends questions that could be used to map out where exactly she lived without actually asking where she lived. Asking her questions like what state she's from, specifically what town, what kind of stores were near her home, and how far away they were to her, specifically Costco. First red flag went off. The second red flag went off when we realized what should have been only a 10 minute ride was now getting closer to a half hour ride and we had somehow ended up back at the resort from which we started our trip. We all noticed that now and asked why we did a loop like that. He answered with some type of non-answer at this point, which none of us understood as he kept driving. It was almost as if he was trying to test how drunk we were and if we would even notice. At this point, no one is talking to him anymore, yet he keeps rambling. One of my friends has now texted her mom, and I have Google Maps out now to make sure he's taking us in the right direction. He then mentioned something about taking us to check out the destination we requested, and then taking us to a nicer part of that area if we don't like it. Third red flag, and now I'm angry. No more being friendly. All too often it seems like women have to choose between being friendly or not to stay safe around men. This was a moment where I needed to make it clear that he was taking us to our destination and nowhere else. I angrily say, absolutely not. We're going to where we asked to be taken. Thinking he can easily mark us as dropped off then take us to a destination where we have no idea what's waiting there for us. Blank expression on his face. No reaction to my anger. But he just keeps rambling about how his spot is better. He eventually drops us off in the right place and we quickly amble out of the car. As we head straight for the nearest casino, I can't help but notice that instead of pulling off and getting right back into traffic, this driver just sits in his car, parked in the red zone that he had dropped us off in. I can feel his eye beams boring into my back as we finally make our way into the casino. Once the door shut behind us, I turn around to face him one final time. This man has now exited his car, and it appears as if he's on the phone. He glances up at the facade of the casino, as if he's trying to tell what casino he just dropped us off at. As his eyes come back to street level, I can tell that he can see me through the doors, peering right at him. He takes this opportunity to flash me the most unsettling, toothiest grin that I've ever seen in my life. My girlfriends and I decide that this is probably the best place to leave this situation. We're in a crowded, people-dense area, lots of cameras, and this man didn't visibly follow us inside. But what's creepy is that this man had 15,000 plus ratings on Lyft. I'd imagine that giving rides is probably his full-time job, but I'd be hard-pressed to think that we're the only ones he's ever given those taken vibes to. While I'm not sure what he was really trying to do or where he was actually trying to take us, I'm proud that we were adamant about him taking us where we wanted to go, and not a step further. Be safe out there, everybody. You never know what people really have planned.
This happened seven years ago, when I was a little more naive, about 30 pounds lighter, still just as short. It was a week before Christmas, and I was finishing up my shopping. My mother, aunt, and nana are all big lottery people, so I tend to get them scratch-off tickets and seasonal tickets as gifts. I don't gamble really, so it's my one time buying them a year. I always go to the same place down the street from me, and I wouldn't say I live anywhere particularly dangerous. Not gated community level safe, but like a solid, children can walk around alone in the dusk sort of safe. Now, I drove an old Saab at the time, and that was a classic no one can drive her but me level finicky. Sometimes, she just wouldn't start unless you held the brake and shifted through the gears. It took forever for me to figure out that that was a special secret handshake. It had a convertible top, but it needed to be manually put back up if you put it down. It wasn't a design feature, it was just a lot of wonky stuff. My brother, who was a lunatic with toxic rage issues, but that's a different story, had broken the handle on my passenger side door right before this story took place. So it's important to know that you couldn't open that door at all anymore. To get in the passenger side, you were either gonna dukes of hazard it, or you were going through the driver's side door to get to your seat. So it's Christmassy, a bit of snow and sludge, but a fairly normal day. I go to the gas station to get the tickets, cash only, so I'd committed to memory just how much cash it was going to take. There are a few people behind me in line, a few people playing Keno in the sitting area. There's this one wiry guy behind me to the side in line, but I didn't notice much other than the fact that he was a little closer than I would have personally liked. I make my purchases, several $20 scratch tickets. My family doesn't want anything less. Bad odds, apparently. A couple year-long season tickets, adding up to just over $400. Ouch. I pay the cashier and head out the door to my janky little sob, sit down, close the door, don't lock it, and begin to count and organize my change and everything. Not even 30 seconds later, that same wiry man comes out and walks right by my car. As he does, he stalls for a split second and tries my passenger side handle. It doesn't work and just makes a clunk as the handle is sort of free moving and doesn't connect to any mechanical stuff at this point. My heart drops and my stomach turns sour. My body knew to panic, but my head hadn't quite caught up yet. As this man's door opening failure proceeds, I see his eyes flicker up at me, almost as if he's gauging whether or not I've clocked what he tried to do. He immediately keeps going, walking out of the parking lot and down the sidewalk out of sight. Until I thought about it later and told some other people about this happening, I didn't even consider that the man was probably going to try to rob me or worse. I am now religiously obsessed with locking my doors as soon as I sit in the car, and I must say I'm a lot more vigilant when it comes to Christmas time, knowing that there are a lot of creeps out there. I think the big kicker to this story is that through all this trouble of getting these tickets and what I perhaps would have gone through had that door opened, none of my family members won on any of their tickets. This was all pretty much for nothing. This story belongs to my sister. Back in 2009, my then 21-year-old sister was living alone after getting into a fight with my parents. She worked as a waitress while going to school, so obviously money was scarce. She was living on the not-so-great side of town in an apartment complex that, from afar, looked okay. But things got weird once you took a step closer. It was one of those two-floor South Florida buildings that had maybe five units occupied. That would have been five out of 20. The rest were in such bad shape that they couldn't be rented. We're talking about holes in the roof, broken pipes, things of that nature. One night, my sister is getting home around 11 p.m. after her shift was done, and she notices this old van parked in one of the spots next to the stairs that she would have to take to get into her apartment. I guess natural instincts kicked in because she decided not to use these stairs, instead using the other set of stairs on the other side of the building. She had to walk across the entire parking lot to reach these stairs. But as she reaches the other stairs and is heading up to her apartment, she looks back at the van and realizes that there's two people sitting in it, just sitting there in the dark, 
looking directly at her. She gets the feeling that now's a good time to hurry up and sort of sprint to her apartment. By now, she sees that these two men have gotten out of the van and they've begun running up the stairs next to their van in what looks like an attempt to catch her. Her apartment is so close to those stairs that by the time she's near her doorway, the men are only two flights from her, a mere 15 steps if we're being generous. She turns around and begins running back towards the stairs that she had just come up from. By the time she's heading down, the men are still in hot pursuit and gaining steps on her. She knew that she couldn't run back across the parking lot because they would have caught her eventually. So instead, when she hit the landing at the bottom of the stairs, she headed towards the back of the building, hoping to jump a fence or find some other means of safety. When she hits the corner of the building, she realizes that unfortunately, the fence was way too high and she obviously wasn't going to make it. So scanning her surroundings, she spots all the way in the corner, there's a big dumpster that has a lock on it. She runs towards it, hoping to use the dumpster as a ladder and then jump the fence from there. But just as she reaches the dumpster, flings herself on top of it, the entire lid collapses under her weight and she falls into the dumpster. As her body comes to rest, she can hear the guys turning into this area and saying she must be inside of one of these apartments. It's important to remember that they were abandoned and some didn't even have windows. So they start calling out to her, telling her to present herself and that she shouldn't be scared. She's inside the dumpster holding the cover up with her hands from the underneath, making it look as if it were closed. They get near it, she can hear their steps. But since the dumpster appeared locked, I guess they didn't even try to pull up on the lid. It was this innocent lock holding this thing together that saved my sister's life. Had they pushed the whole thing up, it would have fallen apart, and my sister would have been exposed and been victim to whatever they had planned. They went inside all of the apartments. She could hear them rummaging. The whole thing must have gone on for 30 to 45 minutes before the guys eventually gave up and left. My sister didn't move though. She stayed concealed in that dumpster until the following morning. She got out when she heard cars and saw the break of daylight. The van wasn't there anymore. And within the day, my sister no longer lived in that apartment. She quickly squashed whatever beef she had with my parents and they allowed her to move back into the house that afternoon. I love my sister dearly, and I'm very glad that she kept her wits during this whole encounter. Instead of just giving up when she fell into that trash receptacle, she kept her cool, and I believe that that act is what allowed her to still be here with us today. And although she's never verbally said it, I feel confident in saying it for her. To those two guys from the van with subpar hide-and-seek skills, I'm glad you never met my sister. Just over a decade ago, I was dating my first ever girlfriend. We had just gone public and came out to our parents officially. At the time, I was 15 and she was 16 if memory serves. Both of us lived in accepting households and went to a rather open school. However, for whatever reason, when we went public, she went fully off the deep end for our final year together. I'll quickly mention that she was really abusive throughout the entire relationship. While my household was open, my home life wasn't exactly easy going. It was abusive in its own right, so I had a hard time recognizing the danger I was in. It felt normal. But it got particularly bad this one evening, when she just snapped, I guess. I'm hesitant to attribute her behavior solely to a psychotic breakdown. I think she was actually an evil person. Genuinely. To summarize the lead up to this quickly, she had recently told me that she had, quote, seven souls living within her, all of which hated me. They were all men from the Victorian era, more or less. She had lost herself to these men, and as each one emerged, she would abuse me in a unique way. I'm going to give them aliases, even though they're not real in my opinion. I'm still afraid of her, and them, I guess. Duke liked to choke me in my sleep. Harold hit me. Hans would try to cut me with knives when I was sleeping. Theo would ignore me and give me the silent treatment. Gerald would force himself on me while I slept. 
Tim would pick apart my appearance and bully me. But Alex, Alex was the worst. And he was the entity I had to deal with the most towards the end. Alex was the one present this evening. He'd play paranormal activity and torment me with the creepiest you've ever seen. He would sing in the corner of the room in the dark, mutter to himself constantly, smile at me while saying things like, you'll die soon, or you don't have to fear me when I'm unarmed. He was also into knives and sharp things, never self-harmed, but would often try to harm me. He'd also convinced me that if I ever left him, he'd kill me. I was 15, like I said, so I believed it. You may be wondering at this point where our parents were in all of this. My parents had just freshly divorced and custody was being settled. I stayed at my partner's place on the weekends and during some weekdays due to it being, quote, safer. Things were so messed up in my own household that it genuinely seemed safer at the time. This is also where my hesitancy comes in with the legitimacy of their psychosis. Whenever their parents were around, they'd snap right out of it, like a light switch. They could turn the crazy off and on just like it was nothing, which makes me think they did this with the intention of harming me, not as a cry for help. Fast forward to the afternoon that it all happened. My final straw. We were downstairs. My girlfriend slash Alex and myself were watching TV. Their parents were going to be out for the whole day, and upstairs was their older sibling who was pretty much a complete hermit kept to their room with soundproof headphones on. Well, Alex also hated this person for no real reason. I was sitting at the downstairs kitchen table working on some homework when I hear Alex start humming in the corner. I turn around and ask if they're okay. They do the creepy smile and nod thing. I went into freeze mode and just went back to my own homework while keeping a close but discreet eye on them. It always got bad for me when I reacted but I had a feeling they were about to have an outburst. They started walking over to the kitchen, still humming, but there was a shake in their voice that I hadn't heard before. I looked up slowly and saw they were taking a large paring knife from the knife block. I remember my adrenaline started to kick in and I looked around for ways to defend myself if the worst were to happen. But to my surprise, they started walking away from me, not towards me. I watched them walk down the hallway and towards the stairs before they exclaimed, I'm going to fucking kill you. I could only presume to their sibling. Something came over me and before I knew it I was booking it up the stairs trying to stop them as they started running, knife in hand, up the stairs. I grabbed their pant leg and pulled them down a few steps. We both collapsed as their sibling opened their bedroom door to ask what was going on. Alex at this point turned around and struck me with a knife, leaving a gash on my arm. I retreated back downstairs as they calmly called out to their sibling, Nothing. Just tripped. I'm okay, but thanks for checking. I ran to the kitchen downstairs, texted my mom to come get me, and began cleaning and bandaging my arm. Alex returned at this point, and as soon as we made eye contact, they dropped the knife. They walked into the kitchen and sat on the floor, and started singing to themselves while rocking back and forth. I was stunned, literally going into shock. I stared at them, bloody tissues in hand, and informed them that I was done with this bull and I was going to wait outside for my mom to come get me. They began crying through the song like they were singing, still smiling like a maniac. I never went back after that. I broke up with them over the phone. They sobbed and told me they'd get rid of their quote, souls and that she still loved me, but I didn't listen. I just hung up and that was that. She even dropped out of school, never saw her again after that. Years later, I found out that she started dating this friend of hers who I was also familiar with as a teenager, then found out she was cheating on me with them for the entire time of our relationship. I've tried to feel bad for her for years, but honestly, I'm still healing from the several attempts at my life. It's hard to feel bad for an abuser, let alone an attacker. When I was 19, I worked nights at this shitty hotel chain in my hometown, and it was generally a pretty chill job. You'd get your run-of-the-mill weirdos and creeps, 
but I can handle my own, and I got used to it pretty quickly. However, this guy was way worse than anything I had encountered up until that very point. It was an average night. I spent it checking guests in, doing laundry, stocking supplies, etc. There were two sets of doors at the entrance, the inner ones being locked after the night shift starts. But this dude shows up about 3 a.m. and rings me through the lobby phone set between the two doors. Immediately, before I can even get my customer service voice on, he starts frantically demanding I call medical transport, which I didn't really know what he was talking about, but I try to help him the best that I can, asking questions, things like that. Eventually, I just let him in so I can get a better idea of how I can help him, but when I do, his whole tone immediately changes. He starts speaking in this monotone voice and has this sort of dead-eye stare. I've never seen eyes so void of all emotion. And not to mention, he had no visible physical signs of injury. At all. Obviously, I was freaked out, but I tried my best to carry on normally, asking him more questions. After the first few questions, he stops answering completely and continues to stare. I just keep repeating myself over and over, but all he's doing is staring right through me. At this point, I'm pretty fed up with what's going on, so I say, all right, man, I'm just going to call 911 to get you help. He then starts getting frantic again, going between begging me not to call and saying, they won't let me go, and I can't go back there. I tell him that I'm really not sure how I can help him if he won't let me call 911. Plus, it didn't even seem like he needed medical assistance in the first place, so he needs to leave. This guy goes right back to ignoring everything I say, but continues his staring. Honestly, I know I should have just called the police right then, but I was overwhelmed by him and his presence, and getting police involved is always the last resort for me. So I say, look, you can rest here on the lobby couch for 20 minutes if you need to find a way to leave. Then you need to go. I say this and then head into the back to watch him on the cameras. 20 minutes come and go, and I come out to tell him that he needs to bounce, but that's when he starts arguing nonsensically. I leave him to his ranting before I head back in exasperation. This cycle then repeats for the next two hours. Finally, I tell him, dude, I'm calling the cops. To which he replies, well, if you're going to be like that, I'll just leave. At this point, 5 a.m., that shit was comical. I'm like, please do. I've wanted that this whole time. I was so done with him, so I was basically yelling. He finally leaves. And I did call the cops, and ended up reporting him as well. The freakiest part was that while telling my boyfriend at the time about this guy, he actually knew who I was talking about from the description of his creepy ass stare. My boyfriend pulls out his phone, and after a quick Google search, pulls up a photo of this mugshot with charges for WAMP, aggravated SA, and a bunch of other stuff. My boyfriend had worked at a homeless shelter for some years at that point, and had seen this guy from time to time. But after that, I felt so lucky that he was just a weird creepy annoyance for me, and not much worse. Who knows what could have gone down, had the circumstances been just a little different that night.